Welcome to the Historical Romance Sampler Podcast, the place for you to find new historical romance books and authors to fan over. I'm award-winning historical romance author Katherine Grant, and each week I'm inviting fellow authors to come on and share a little bit of their work and themselves. They'll read a sample of one of their books, and then I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions. By the end of the episode, you'll have a sense of what they write and who they are. Hopefully, you and I both will have something new to read. So what are we waiting for? Let's get into this week's episode. Welcome everyone to today's episode. I am joined today by Andrea Janelle. Andrea wrote her first story about a friendly giant that saved a ladybug when she was six. She has at least three journals crammed full of poetry. And in middle school and high school, Andrea had a nonprofit side gig writing love stories for her friends that featured characters with their names, which by the way, you should totally write into a young adult novel soon. <laughs> I plan on it at some point, yeah. (laughs) As a young single mom in the early 1990s, Andrea was discouraged from pursuing a writing career. So in 2022, the year she turned 50, Andrea decided it was time to make her dream a reality. Andrea knew she wanted to write in several romance categories and release at least three books a year, which is a big ask. So (laughs) indie publishing was an automatic decision. I'm really glad you made that decision and welcome to the podcast, Andrea. Thank you, Catherine. I am so happy to be here. Um, we'll talk more about why I write in all those different <laughs> Yes, later. we will. <laughs> yes. But I, I'd like to read an excerpt from my upcoming Victorian historical. It is actually releasing at the end of February. This is the story of the second sister and the second Wainwright sister, the first sister story released in November of last year. So This sister, her story begins during the Crimean War. She is um, a nurse. So when she originally volunteered to go over to the Crimean um, battlefront, it was not under Florence Nightingale's auspices. There were several women who um, joined other volunteer efforts and went over there to serve. But after about a year and a half of the war going on, there were so many decimations in the ranks. Several nurses had died of cholera. Several had decided it wasn't for them that Florence Nightingale did start recruiting women from other like other areas so my heroine said okay I think I'm done with the battlefront I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and apply to be you know to be a nurse at Skatari hospital so so she's done that she's there this is actually her first full day there and the hero who is um, now the chief surgeon he's Irish this is their first meeting and he's been told of her presence by his friend who was like, you know, this new nurse isn't like any of the other nurses. And he's he's very skeptical. He's like, whatever, I don't need someone distracting me from my work. <laughs> so I actually modeled him after House and Owen Hunt from Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> if you're nice. Grey's Anatomy fan. <laughs> yeah. So so this is their first meeting, and it is it is from Mac's perspective. So Mac is the hero. The following morning, Mac set aside his bleary disposition and the vestiges of too much whiskey. Cholera, mini balls, trench fever, and all sorts of other maladies and wounds were devastating the ranks, and today he'd be treating them all. The improvements to hygiene and supplies he tried to implement, and Nurse Nightingale's organizational efforts hadn't been enough to reduce the mortality rate. It still hovered around 40%. Although he looked forward to proving Hotchkiss wrong, catching a glimpse of the new nurse would be nigh impossible. He removed the watch from his inner pocket and sat down beside the youth they'd operated on last night. The boy was still asleep, and his pulse was sluggish but steady. Although he'd taken every precaution, his care hadn't erased the likelihood of infection. He snapped the watch closed and pulled out his stethoscope. There was a gaggle of nurses headed his way. They were packed so closely into the waddling formation, they nearly tripped on each other's heels. Except for the straggler at the end of the ragged queue. She followed unobtrusively, like she wanted nothing more than to blend into the background and remain unnoticed. He wondered if she was the nurse Hotchkiss had been raving about, and his curiosity was piqued. He figured he would discover her identity soon enough and turn back to the once ready-cheeked youth lying in the cot. He needed to assess the patient's likelihood of survival beyond this night, because the youth's heartbeat was a trifle erratic. Mac wondered if they had any digitalis in their stores. He was rising from his cross beside the bed, satisfied the boy would make it into the next day, and intent on rummaging for digitalis in case he needed it later when he came face to face with the new nurse. An end-drawn gasp, 
like the snick of a lock rhyming home, cut through the relative silence behind him. He swiftly turned and caught the flutter of a hand falling to the side, like a moth trapped in the sliver of gaslight. He immediately leapt to the rescue and managed to scoop her up mere moments before she tumbled to the floor. You needn't have caught me. Her eyes were fastened on his, and they were such a stark midnight blue, he grew winded on the spot. It was like looking at the horizon against the backdrop of green meadows right before a storm. The golden freckles sprinkled across the bridge of her nose found out like the soft down of fledgling bird wings over her cheeks, and he wanted to connect them with his fingertips. Her hair was deep, dark sable, not nondescript brown. Her skin was luminous, like she danced through a cloud of the fairy dust his mother had always believed in. She wasn't mousy. She was the furthest thing from mousy he'd ever encountered. Let me reiterate, you needn't have caught me. Her words shattered the silence and reminded him where they were. Mac had scoffed at what he thought was Hotchkiss's hyperbole last night. He'd been confident he had the moral fiber to resist whatever temptation was posed by Nightingale's newest nurse. But now he was stricken speechless, just as Hotchkiss had predicted. You were looking forward to ruses then. I had borne much worse. Her voice was a husky alto with a hint of broad West Country accent. It reverberated through him, just like her eyes. He fell into the promise of the sweet, warm weight of the curves nestled against his chest. She was all lush bounty in the cradle of his arms, and it was only too easy to imagine the satin of her skin behind the cage of her corset and crinoline. Her gaze was focused on him like the lure of the moon-clad knight in the Byron poem Hotchkiss had referred to, a stupidly romantic poem Mac had often scoffed at. He had been as certain of Hotchkiss's hyperbole as he was of the man's intolerance of more than two fingers of Irish whiskey in a sitting. For once, Hotchkiss hadn't been exaggerating. That lack of exaggeration made Mac ir irrationally angry. He didn't want to notice her eyes. He didn't want to relish the curve of her body in his arms. He didn't want to acknowledge the helpless way his gaze dropped from her spangled midnight eyes to the pale pink bow of her lips. Sheer temptation disguised in gray wool. Sheer temptation he wanted to taste. He wasn't a poet, and he never claimed to be one. The only verse he'd ever memorized was body limericks. But he was now convinced her eyes would inspire any man to compose a sonnet, even one who'd only memorized naughty limericks. Are you okay, madam? he gruffly asked. He didn't bother reining in his impatience or disguising his irritation. She was both impossibility and possibility, only missing a pair of wings, and the lack of feathers brushing against his knuckles where he clasped her upper shoulders was almost a shock. Surely she'd fallen from heaven and was there to drag him to purgatory. He didn't have time for a taste of heaven or a descent into purgatory. He wanted to drop her to the floor for making him consider an indulgence in either of those things. He suspected she had the potential to shred the delicate balance of his life. He had no room for emotional entanglements or sparkling, watchful midnight eyes. If he wanted to rise in his profession after this infernal war, he needed a spotless reputation and a match that improved his social standing. The quality of this woman's scuffed boots and the fact she was here instead of cultivating a genteel existence shouted her station in life louder than any flower seller hawking watercress and violets. He'd wager her beginnings were as humble as his own and he needed a helpmeet who would guarantee him access to the sitting rooms his Irishness would bar him from. The endless barrage of sweating, dying, blood-soaked bodies bombarding the hospital drove a man to the dark places inside his head. There was no room or thought left to spare for dwelling on the dubious charms of one of the newly minted nurses. But if she so much as shifted, he feared he'd tumble head over heels like a flimsy house of cards. She chewed her bottom lip, the picture of trepidation, and he bent his head to soothe away the mark. She floundered in his arms and jerked backward like she just laid eyes on her own fetch. Her flailing reminded him they weren't alone. Her eyes and that bitten lip had rendered him oblivious to the audience. When he turned and set his scrambling cargo firmly on her feet, Mrs. Nightingale sniffed in disapproval. The other nurses avidly glanced back and forth between them. The hushed murmurs of the ward signaled his uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic behavior hadn't gone unnoticed. The woman adjusted the ends of the scarf around her neck and brushed imaginary flecks of dust from the apron she wore over the gray wool dress. When she'd finished, the needle gaze she rose to his made him feel like a tangled skein of wool. It was impossible to tell if she was grateful for his rescue. I'm Nurse Wainwright. I'm Vern. He captured her slim hand in his own, just long enough for a brief shake. Her fingers and wrist bones were fragile, and he felt the skip of her pulse. She slid from his grasp. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Byrne. I look forward to assisting you in the other positions. He cleared his throat, acutely aware of the way Nightingale was impatiently hovering just beyond his shoulder. 
She hadn't interrupted yet, but he was well acquainted with her brash manner and knew an interruption was imminent. As I'm sure Nurse Nightingale has conveyed, the conditions here are anything but optimal, and we require all hands on deck. He nearly winced at the naval reference. I hope the sight of blood doesn't always have this effect on you. Her mouth curled at the corner in a half smirk. It doesn't. I'm sorry you had to step in and rescue me. He wanted to wipe away that smirk with a pat of his thumb. I hope you aren't normally queasy, Miss Wainwright. You won't last long if you don't have a stomach of iron and the will to match it. She bracketed her hands on her hips, and he braced himself for a set-down. She was anything but meek and mild. Hotchkiss was delusional. I'll thank you to keep your opinions about my staff to yourself, Mr. Byrne. I assure you they are well prepared for their duties. Mrs. Nightingale finally interrupted. Cormac should be thanking her for the interruption, because facing this woman felt like maneuvering a flimsy canoe between treacherous coral reefs that would rip it asunder. It would be wise to welcome the interruption. Instead, he resented it, but he had no choice other than bowing in her direction. My humble apologies for any slight. I did not intend to impugn your staff. She sniffed again. In the future, please keep your observations to yourself, Mr. Byrne. They are both unsolicited and unwelcome. Nurse Wainwright joined us from the battlefront, where she was administering care with Miss Siegel and other volunteers. I assure you, the sight of blood does not make her squeamish. Mac Riley saluted her. As if she sensed his irreverence, Nightingale's nostrils flared and her eyes narrowed. I do not appreciate being mocked. I will be reporting your flippancy to your superiors. So she hadn't heard the news. He took great relish in being the one to inform her of the new chain of command. That may be difficult, Nurse Nightingale. Dr. Huddleston was relieved of his post and sent packing to London two weeks ago. I've been promoted to the position of chief surgeon. Her shoulders stiffened, and the Siberian winter in her eyes clearly indicated she didn't agree with the decision to elevate him. He knew her opinion was shared by many because he was nothing more than the orphaned, jumped-up son of an Irish tenant farmer. She and his colleagues always left at the chance to remind him of his humble beginnings. You have my congratulations, she bit out. The new nurse watched their exchange with a sly smile. He imagined she was smiling because she felt he was getting the comeuppance he deserved. Do you find our exchange amusing, Nurse Wainwright? barked Nightingale. Anything but a mouse widened her eyes and vigorously shook her head. No, Nurse Nightingale, I was simply remembering the way my sisters and I always jockeyed for the upper hand. I believe that the spirit of cooperation should always be employed to achieve the best results, especially when we are spread so thinly and must care for so many. From the mouths of babes. My apologies again, Nurse Nightingale, to you and your staff for my glib conversation. Nightingale inclined her head in a cursory nod. Apology accepted, Mr. Byrne. Come along, Nurse Wainwright. We haven't time to lollygag. You can spar with Mr. Byrne when you find yourself assigned to his floor. He sketched a bow in their direction that was met with a loud harumph. He was lost in thought, watching them walk away, when someone slapped him so hard on the shoulder he staggered forward. What I tell you, old chap, a sight for sore eyes, ain't she? The way she was looking up at you when you caught her makes a man think of, inappro makes a man think of inappropriate things. Hotchkiss's comment settled in Cormac's gut like a venomous barb, reminding him of his inconvenient reaction and ill-advised near loss of control. He'd been on the verge of bloody kissing her. We should speak of them with respect, no matter what we think of the necessity of their role, Hotchkiss. It's inappropriate to speak of Nurse Wainwright as you were a woman of the streets. Hotchkiss's brows flew into his hairline as he guffawed. Ha! Oh, I see how the wind is blowing. Already ensnared you, has she? It's not like that. He couldn't afford the possibility of something like that. Not if he wanted to keep his new position and use it to leverage a lucrative career when he returned home. Yeah. How intriguing. What a great meeting. Setting them up to be, they could be enemies. They could be allies. Really, it's all up to how they react to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing that. We are going to get into the interview portion soon, but first, a break for our sponsors. Hey, Samplers, it's Katherine Grant. I am interrupting this episode to tell you how to get a free book, The Viscount Without Virtue. First, go to bit.ly slash hrsfan. Go through the checkout process. This is where you add the promo code HRSFAN as your last step. Just download your free ebook to your e-reader. All right, well, let's get back to this week's episode. All right, so we are back with Andrea Janelle, who just read a really great excerpt from her book, How Francis Wainwright Learns to Love. 
And we just saw the meet cute of Francis and Mac, the doctor. And I couldn't help but notice a key character in that meet cute is Florence Nightingale, who is, yeah. of course, a real person. Yeah. So I'd really love to know, just to kick things off, how did you go about portraying Florence Nightingale? And did you always know she was going to be in the text? Or did you make that decision as you were researching her? So I knew she was going to be in the text just because she played such an integral role at Scutari Hospital, which is where the book is set initially. Midway through the book, well, they're in Scutari slash the Crimea for about the first half of the book. And then the second half of the book, they're actually in London. But I, I like you can't talk about Scutari Hospital and the Crimean War without talking about Florence Nightingale, because as you know, the the out one of the major outcomes of the Crimean War was the fact that that was like the genesis of modern medicine in terms of cleanliness. Like there were there were physicians who had advocated for it before, like Lister, which I have a whole conversation with him about Lister later, had advocated for the use of um, carbolic acid for cleaning implements. But before Florence Nightingale and the Crimean War, the practice of medicine, you were as likely to die of infection as you were to die of the surgery. Yeah. So, so, you know, she's such an integral part. There's no way I couldn't portray her. So I read, I did read all of her correspondence that she had sent back to her funding to the people who funded her endeavor. I read all of those letters. I also read two biographies of her and some other like contemporary accounts. So she was very, she was very much a product of the Victorian era, but then she was not. She was raised in kind of a non-traditional household. She was the daughter, I believe her, her father was a member of the clergy. So she had an education. They they did discourage her from pursuing nursing though. They said it was not, you know, was not a career that a young woman should pursue. She mm. they eventually caved in because she's like, this is what I'm really passionate about. And so and just like that, you know, portraying her personality and that she was so she was so passionate and devoted to what she was doing, but also very brusque to those she, who worked for her and with her. Like she was no nonsense just from, that's what I gather from everything I've read. So. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So that leads me to wonder uh, a couple of things. First of all, you are writing stories across so many different types of the romance genre did this story come to you or this series come to you and you were like, oh, I have these interesting dynamics, but I don't know what setting I want to explore? Or did it come to you where you knew that you wanted it, it to be Victorian and you wanted this book to be about the Crimean War? I, it came, like I knew I wanted to write a Victorian series. So, and I've had it planned for a long time. So I have all seven books planned out, but I knew that I wanted to write about characters we don't often hear about who, because, you know, they had their love stories too, right? So I didn't want to write another book about dukes, et cetera. <laughs> so, so none of my characters are members of the nobility. They might be like wealthier landowners, like in the first book, Thaddeus, he, he, do, he does have a substantial farm. I kind of modeled him after Mr. Martin and Emma, like that kind of a holding. So, so but again, you know, not, not traditional, you know, not the nobility. So. Yeah, well, we need a lot less of the nobility. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and arguably, I would say in real life, the nobility had far fewer love stories than the working class people. Just just on the basis of how many of them there were, right? <laughs> because... that, yeah, that alone. And then also we know that they were like, you know, living these lives where they weren't marrying for love, whereas yeah. the working class didn't have that structure as much. Exactly. So why the Victorian period? So I chose the Victorian period because I, that is when women's suffrage really took off. It is also when a lot of the legal restrictions that were placed on women were lifted that had been there previously, you know, as to property ownership, how they could live their lives. It's also the rise of the middle class as opposed to the Regency period. The Regency period was the late Regency period there. It was starting to happen a little bit, but the Victorian period, it definitely happened. And the middle class and trades were a different avenue to wealth and to prosperity. And that meant you didn't have to be a farmer. <laughs> so right. that's the reason I chose the Victorian age instead of the Regency period. That makes sense. So would you say you're interested in exploring the narratives of suffragettes or people who were advocating for class uh, class change? I am. And actually, I, I will be incorporating that into, well, 
some of it is incorporated in this book. There's this whole discussion they have about Emerson <laughs> and like self-actualization. Like, so, so yeah, I do explore those themes in this book too, but these seven sisters are very erudite, like for their age. One of the sisters like runs the town lending library and she's like writing her own stories. And then another one is an apothecary's. She's the apothecary's apprentice slash assistant. So, you know, I, I wanted to show how like that suffragette theory had already trickled down to the middle class and this was happening. So Yeah, that's really cool. You obviously do a lot of research for your yeah. books. You've already yeah. mentioned quite a few of those. So how do you incorporate that into your writing process? So I do do an outline and then I, based on that outline, I figure out what I need to research, right? So, so I, I really wanted my description of the surgeries and the conditions in the hospital to be accurate. So I made sure I researched those things. I actually read this book published in eight, I think it was 1853. It was the battlefield surgeons or sorry, the surgeon's guide to Anyway, it was like it was like a surgeon's guide. An to actual primary text. Surgery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like a, like a contemporary text. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a medical background? I do not. I'm an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so you all you were researching how they did it back then and then also under trying to learn like, well, what does that mean? How exactly, would we understand that today? Exactly. Wow. And so do you find that does that because you write historical, you also mm-hmm. write contemporary because there's so much and, research that you do. And paranormal. <laughs> and paranormal. So because there's so much research that you have to do for the historical, do you find that that changes your craft for writing the historical or does it, do they all kind of feel the same? They all kind of feel the same, but I do write them in different POVs, right? So obviously the historical is third person, um, whereas both my both my contemporary and my both my contemporary and my paranormal or first person POV alternating oh interesting yeah alter female male you know female male main character so and I do got a little bit in this but again it's still from the third person so interesting and in terms of I'm going back to the time period that you chose when I'm writing Regency, I do a lot of research and I put that into my books, but I also know that most readers who are picking up a Regency historical have some basic understanding of Regency right. England. And so there's right. a little bit of, I don't have to do world building for yeah. what is a Duke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you think about building, especially with the Crimean War, like people <laughs> heard about it, but like, we don't really know where is the Crimea anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So um, how do you think about the world building aspect? So that one, again, I had to be very um, particular. Like I have all these maps of the Crimea. <laughs> like um, I actually read, this is really cool um, book. It's Mrs. Duberly's journals. And she was, she was one of the women that followed the drum. I actually model one of Fran's friends after her. So she had these really, really interesting journal. She was the wife of a quartermaster um, during the Korean War. And just like the, she ta- the way she talks about the scenes and like the battles and like the setting. So I had to do a lot of research about that, right? Mm-hmm. And the same with, so friends from Cumbria. So when she goes back home after the war, I had to like, I had done a lot of that research anyway, because the entirety of the first book takes place in Cumbria. So I'd already done a lot of that research, but that's incorporated as well. And then London, like I have this really cool book. It's it's like, it's like lays out like forgotten places in London, but like there are all these maps of like what Victorian London looked like and where um, the hospital that Francis, I'm sorry, where the hospital that Fran works at and that Nurse Nightingale started was located. So, so oh, cool. You know, yeah. So. And have you found that readers understand the Victorian era as? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. So, so, okay. It's it's funny you ask that because I, I can talk about this a little bit. So, so there was a, there was a lot more freedom for women in that period and then there was in the Regency era. And there was also a lot more freedom for women in the middle class than there was for women in the nobility, as far as like their sexuality, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, so the first book, was, <laughs> the first book in the series is definitely has some scenes. Okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and I, I did I did get some but this doesn't read like a reason to see other and I actually like there's there are like instruments that are used on in the first book and I like did my research right like so they 
their things were available and they were used. So, but it was just interesting, like the feedback I got about that. (laughs) That is interesting. I think it, it is interesting to walk that line in terms of readers think that they know a lot, but we're the ones doing the research. First of all, we're not historians, but we have done a lot of research for our books, probably more than the reader who is just reading for fun has done. And then also, I think there's so many exceptions to any rule Yeah, that sometimes it's like, well, you might not have encountered this before in literature, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Exactly. And it's so funny you say that. So one of my beta readers, I'm um, one of the um, women on my art team, she um, actually has her, um, she actually has her doctorate in um, Victorian literature and like Victorian history. So like, uh, now her take on this, on like the first book was like, wow, this is a very accurate portrayal of women's roles in the Victorian period, you know, and <laughs> Right. So that like made me happy because I'm like, okay, I did my research. Right. But then like, then, you know, there are other readers who are like, oh, this doesn't read. This is like too modern. And by modern, I think they mean that um, they're used to reading Regency probably. And they're used to like, like books that don't deal with anything other than the the nobility. Right. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, I've, I've done so much research on like, you know, the socioeconomics of the period and like, like what I what the conversations were that were happening you know in the middle class and in the lower class I mean they they weren't ignorant and literacy was finally taking off because there were like village schools right yeah yeah Yeah. no absolutely and there were also so many people and there was a lot of change happening so there was a lot of things that were happening that we might not have learned about in school but it was Mm -hmm. still happening exactly so why do you write so much? <laughs> honestly, honestly, like, I don't know how not to do it. Like, I've done it my whole life. But like, this is finally me like putting it out there. So sometimes I think I'm a little too ambitious. right? So I so I put three, bu- I put my first three books out in 2022. I put five out in 2023, like counting the novella. And then I'm putting out four this year plus a novella. So this one, this the one that I just read the excerpt from. And then I have um, my sixth Willow Creek book is coming out at the end of April. And then my second paranormal, the end of June. And then my seventh Willow Creek book, October. And then I have the third historical, which is that Christmas novella is coming out in November. But I, (laughs) but like I do, like I have all the elements already and I probably have like, um, so the one that's coming out, I'm I'm almost at the end. I think I have like 65,000 words. So I'm almost done with that one. Um, but the other ones I have at least, you know, 10,000 or more words on each of them already. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm ADHD. So <laughs> sometimes I get tired of writing like about one couple and I'll like move to another couple. Right. And then come back to what I that was doing. I've actually heard that from other authors who identify as ADHD, that they have all these stories that they're producing all the time. And I am very much not ADHD. And so I'm like, <laughs> For example, I'm working on a draft right now and I got the edits back for another book this, yeah, last night. And I'm like, well, I can't look at those edits until I finish <laughs> this draft because otherwise I'm gotcha. just going to get very confused. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> um, okay. And I would love to ask on your website, you say mm-hmm. you believe in cinnamon rolls and yeah. I believe in cinnamon rolls too, but I would like to know what does it mean to you to have a cinnamon roll hero? So a cinnamon roll hero, he might not appear to be a cinnamon roll on the outside, but the part that makes him a cinnamon roll is the caretaking that he does, right? Mm. So, so like softy on the inside, like I'm going to bring you breakfast in bed. I'm going to massage your feet. (laughs) I'm I'm going to, you know, so, so like, so like all of my, all of my Willow Creek heroes and, and like my paranormal and my historical, they all have that kernel of softness, right? So Mm -hmm. like that the heroine unlocks yes oh I like that yeah they're not afraid of the feelings that are inside of them and to share them with their heroine yeah exactly yeah Yeah. so she brings out that vulnerability in them so to be a cinnamon roll hero means like you have that vulnerability and you're not afraid to claim it once once you realize that you feel that way about someone and you're not afraid to express it and I'm married to a cinnamon roll (laughs) 
<laughs> I am too. My husband, when I was going, I, I went to celebrate Christmas with my family. He didn't come with me. And I was talking about what I was planning to do. And I said, I'm going to make cinnamon rolls for Christmas. And he was like, you've got to make cinnamon rolls because you're leaving your cinnamon roll behind. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> I love that so much. All right. Well, so it is time to move on to our very fun segment. Are you a romantic? Okay. Which do you trust more? Your heart, your gut, or your brain? Definitely my heart. Do you believe in love at first sight? I do. Do you think there's a difference between lust and love? Absolutely. Do you believe in soulmates? I do. Do you believe in true love? And is it the same? They're not the same, but yes, I do. Ooh. What makes an apology meaningful? True remorse. And you can see that in the way that the person makes the apology. And finally, why is romantic love important? It's important because it shows us that we're valued as human beings, right? By someone other than ourselves, you know, that we have a value to add to the world and that our perspective and who we are is important. Andrea, I think you're a romantic. I definitely am. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. For our listeners, where can they find you and your books? So all of my books are, you can buy them on paperback, on Barnes & Noble, on Amazon. My audiobooks are available on Audible and iTunes. So No Regrets is the first one that was produced in audio. I have four audiobooks coming out this year as well that are like recordings of my books I've published in the last two years. Those will also be on Audible and iTunes. My, for now, my first historical and the Willow Creek series are all in KU. However, I will be pulling that stuff out of KU and dropping it in Kobo Plus when the enrollment period ends for each of those, just because I, it's, it's not, it's not economically, it's just not economically sustainable (laughs) to like keep them in KU, so Great. And do you have a website or social media that you want people to I go do. to? I do. So you can actually go to my website. It's andreajanelleromance.com. And all the links to all my social media is there. I'm, that is like one of the things I did not know was going to be so crazy as an indie author. So I have a TikTok and Instagram threads, BookBub, my website, Facebook. And I also have a um, Facebook reader group if anyone's interested in joining. But you can find like all those links are I'm on my website. So Awesome. Thank you. And I do, I think not many readers are aware of BookBub, but it's a great place to follow authors. It helps us business-wise if we get to a thousand followers. And then also as a reader, you will get alerts when our books are up for pre-order, when they are released, and also when they are on sale. So it's definitely a good place to go follow authors. Yeah. And if, if you guys, if the, your readers are interested, this book that I read the excerpt from, the pre-order is up on Amazon but it will be in KU. So awesome. And so how Francis Wainwright learns to love comes out February 28th and readers can go get it on Amazon. That's it for this week. Check out the show notes where I put links for my guests, myself, and the podcast until next week. Happy reading.